I might have guessed. Do you know him? Not socially. His name's Jaws. He kills people. Richard Keel. He played Jaws, a guy with steel teeth that could seemingly bite through anything. He's the only henchman in Bond history that was brought back again because of audience demand. People loved this character. Sure, he was trying to kill our hero, but there was something about him that was endearing. He was just doing his job, and thanks to Keel's sensibilities as an actor, there was a lot of comedy in his portrayal. But James Bond is really just a small blip in this guy's life. Richard Keel was truly an amazing man, and I'm going to spend the next 30 minutes explaining why in excruciating detail. I'm not kidding, if you're maybe stuck in a tough place in life right now, depressed, unmotivated, just beaten down in general, just sit back and absorb this man's story. And just a side note, I'm basing most of the information in this episode on Richard's official autobiography, making it big in the movies. I'm lucky I found a copy of this, tucked away on the third floor of the library in downtown LA. I wonder how long it sat there before I checked it out. Richard Dawson Keel was born in Detroit, Michigan on September 13th, 1939. His father was a car salesman selling Fords, while his mother took care of Richard and his little sister, George Ann. In Richard's own words, family life at the Keels was simple and full of love, complete with watermarks like his first bike, first time on a horse, friends, fishing trips, Halloween. Although Richard would eventually grow to a height of seven feet and one and three quarters of an inch, which he later learned to round up to seven foot two, because it's simpler to say, he didn't show any abnormal signs of growth at this age. He did have a slight health problem when he was in grade school. His doctors noticed that he was developing a lazy right eye. He was told to do special eye exercises to line his eyes up again. They helped, and although he prevented himself from going cross-eyed, he never gained sight back in his right eye. Richard says, I must say that this gave me a distinct look later on in the movies, as I move my head more than other actors in order to survey a scene. While Richard was still in grade school, he and his family moved to Southern California, where his father made a good living selling appliances. He was doing so well they eventually opened up their own appliance store in Baldwin Park called Keel's Appliances and Furniture. Richard got his first taste of how much fun acting can be when he took a speech class, and although he was terrified to improvise a comedic five-minute speech in front of the class, he didn't let anybody see it and made everybody laugh. To this day, he gives credit to Mr. Greeley, his English teacher that encouraged him to get into public speaking, which led to an interest in acting. After Richard hit puberty, he skyrocketed to a height of six foot eight by the time he was a freshman in high school. Throughout high school, he worked for his father selling and delivering appliances. He says, We sold the heaviest refrigerators and gas ranges available, so I was tailor-made for the work. When Richard was 17, his father died suddenly of a heart attack. Richard tried for the next couple years to keep the appliance store afloat with his mother, but there was a major recession in 1958 and they had to close down. At the age of 19 and at a height of 7 foot 2, weighing 350 pounds, Richard moved to the San Fernando Valley in LA and decided that he wanted to be an actor. And so began a journey that I'm sure lots of struggling actors are familiar with. He had several side jobs while he was trying to get himself out there. You know, I, I did all kinds of things. I, uh, I sold vacuum cleaners uh, uh, and... Door-to-door uh, -door kind of stuff? Yeah, yeah, door-to-door. Yeah, -door. But folks were happy to see you on the porch. <laughs> Before that, I was a bouncer in uh, some of the uh, famous country and western gin mills in, uh, in the... What, where was this? Uh, well, one was called the Rag Doll. Where about? And, uh, what part of the country? Uh, North Hollywood. Oh, I see, yeah. And uh, actually, that's where I learned how to be an actor. Yeah. You know, they get these crazy guys, you know, they get too much to drink, and uh, and so they come up to me, and I, I f figured rather than argue with them, I just kind of be real friendly, and I go... <laughs> 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 yeah. And then, uh, sober to, sober to yeah. After his job as a bouncer, he sold Echo Units for a company that sold Hammond organs. It was during this job that he got a call from someone at the nightclub he used to work at. NBC was putting together a pilot based on The Phantom and was looking for a sparring partner to do stunts with the three actors competing for the lead. Casting said that if the producers liked Richard enough, they would cast him as a villain in the actual pilot. Well, they did, and Richard worked one of his first jobs as an actor. What do you care? You got your money. You'll never make it. Don't forget, you covered the leopard bait. I'll make it. Bait or no bait, I got a plan. 
Now it's important to note that Richard's acting career early on is a great example of how things usually go in the business, or at least how you should expect them to go. He started to get work as an actor, but it wasn't enough to live on completely. He wouldn't make a living solely on acting work until the mid-1970s. As a result, he continued working side jobs. He did more sales work, he was a prop man on studio lots, and he installed screen doors. During this time, he was barely making ends meet. It didn't help that he also got married really young to a woman named Faye, and he was supporting her and her teenage son. Luckily, thanks to his height and his nice demeanor, he was able to network with a lot of people in the business without even trying. He got a part here and there, which led to other parts when executives would say, hey, I want that tall guy for my project. It was all momentum, and it slowly built up. So what kind of roles did Richard play? Well, thanks to his height, he was a perfect candidate for one of the most popular genres in the early 60s, sci-fi and good old-fashioned B-movie sci-fi. In fact, he was in three movies that were featured in episodes of one of my favorite shows, Mystery Science Theater 3000. He played an alien in The Phantom Planet. Okay, what'd I do? A caveman in Ega. Hey, me look like Anthony Michael Hall. And another alien in The Human Duplicators. Um, As in the case of Professor Dornheimer, this type of android is extremely sophisticated. He likes no coward and martini. And in a show where a guy and two robots mercilessly make fun of bad movies, Richard Keel was one of the only shining moments for them. Oh, Richard Keel, a real star for once. Your movie this week, e -ga, has got Richard Keel and not much else. Some other highlights include a horror movie called House of the Damned. <laughs> What is he doing right there? Is he strangling her? I guess. And perhaps his most famous role in a sci-fi production, To Serve Man, an iconic Twilight Zone episode. Ladies and gentlemen of the Earth, we greet you in peace and friendship. Although we know your language, our own methods of communication are mental rather than verbal. His voice was dubbed by someone else. Richard says that this was the plan from the start, although he implies that he had a chance in the audition to prove that he could do the dialogue. But he was so tired from the drive to set and the hours of makeup that he wasn't properly prepared to say his lines. Although I think the end result works just fine, Richard kind of beat himself up for it at the time. What's cool about Richard, and this is something that I think a lot of actors need to take to heart, is that he didn't just sit around waiting for acting jobs to come to him. He was actively putting everything he could into making a career out of entertainment. In the early 60s, Richard took some time and attended a radio and TV engineering school in Burbank, aced his classes, and got an engineering license. This allowed him to start pitching an idea he had for a children's television show based on Paul Bunyan, with himself playing the host. He sent out a package to a number of TV stations pitching the idea, and instead of just sending a headshot and resume, he would also include a long string with a circle on one end and a small weight on the other. He instructed whoever opened it to tack the circle against the wall high enough to allow the weight to barely touch the floor, and that would illustrate how tall he was. He immediately got responses and began doing a live production of The Paul Bunyan Show every Saturday morning at 8 a.m. It's The Paul Bunyan Show! <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Say, I'll take that hat up. Hey, wasn't that fun? Yeah. And speaking of fun, we're going to have lots of fun today. It was a variety show with short sketches, puppet shows, and actual kids who would be asked loaded questions, kind of like on Kids Say the Darndest Things. It was successful for a while, and Richard also made a lot of public appearances around the state of California as Paul Bunyan, handing out samples of their sponsor, Dr. Pepper, to kids at grocery stores and town fairs. If there's anything Richard knew how to do, it was how to sell himself. Something I admire about him is that he knew what he was worth, as a person and as an actor. There are little moments in his career where he recognized that he had moved up the ladder a bit, so to speak, and thus he could negotiate better things for himself instead of settling for whatever work came his way. Things like better pay, better hotel accommodations, things like that. One example is when he was working on an episode of Lassie, and production was supposed to be paying everybody overtime quadruple pay because they were working around Thanksgiving. One day on set, production came to Richard and said that they couldn't afford to pay him over time and they promised to use him again in the future if he agreed. Richard says, I thought that was colossal nerve to work people 17 or 18 hours on a Thanksgiving and not pay them extra for it. I held my ground and made them pay me, which they respected, and a few years later I did an eight-part show for them as well. There's also this other story that Richard tells about working on a film called Skidoo. 
The director, Otto Preminger, fresh off from directing It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, was a notorious asshole. There was one scene where Preminger kept yelling at actor Austin Pendleton, claiming that he was ruining the scene he was in. Now in real life, Austin had overcome a stuttering problem through therapy, but after Preminger yelled at him, it made him more nervous and he stuttered a lot during the scene. Uh, uh, is this good enough? Shut up. So Richard had a scene where his character's high on LSD, and another character slaps him in the face to wake him up. I think it's deleted from the film, but it would have happened right around here. During rehearsals, Preminger was showing the other actor how to hit Richard, and actually slapped Richard hard in the face. Now, you don't do that without consulting the actor, and even so, there's no need to actually make contact when you're doing a run-through. Richard says, I'm a pretty cool-headed guy, and I have learned in life how to control my temper and walk away from senseless fights. But after watching this jerk abuse people for weeks, I was not my usual calm self, and I put my nose in his face and in a hoarse whisper told him, If you so much as touch me again, I'll fucking kill you. He got the point, and because he sensed that I really meant it, he never did anything or said anything that might possibly upset me from that moment forward. That's awesome. As the 60s continued, he popped up in a number of big productions like The Wild Wild West. What's that, another gadget? What happens when you twist that? I see. It comes out of the wall. Gilligan's Island. This island. She's crazy. To pick me up. Hurry. Everybody, there he is. Oh, never mind. I pick you up. That voice has got to be dubbed. The monkeys. Now, where is the little monster? There he is. No. <laughs> And I spy. You want a fair fight, Tiny? Here's a fair fight. I think I said the wrong thing. Okay. Even though he was working a lot as an actor, he still continued working side jobs. He started selling Lincoln Mercury cars and was really good at it. Thanks to the income from the cars, he started buying lots and building houses on the lots, then renting them out or selling them and buying more lots and more houses. He was spending so much time flipping houses at one point that he wasn't really acting as much. Then came Richard's first big break when he worked with Burt Reynolds on the film The Longest Yard. He broke my fucking nose! He broke my nose! I'm gonna fix it, okay? How does it look? Oh, it looks a hundred percent better, doesn't it? Hundred percent? Oh yeah. No, he did that on purpose. No, he didn't. Yes, he did. Tell me sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, everybody, hold up, hold up, let's go. He, he said he was sorry. He's funny. Despite his size, his character's a big softy. With people like Richard Keel, it works to go against the audience's expectations sometimes. This movie's also a classic example of how often directors would use exaggerated camera angles to make Richard look even taller. Also makes sense. If you have an actor who's seven foot two, you want to position the cameras in a way where the audience can really notice it. And if you're gonna be that close, may as well have him stand on an apple box and make him look even more foreboding. Also on the set of The Longest Yard, Richard met his second wife, Diane, who he spent the rest of his life with. His first marriage with Faye had a lot of ups and downs. In fact, during a fight one time, Faye threw some keys at Richard's forehead, causing the cyst to grow that would eventually disfigure his face somewhat. When they got divorced in 1973, he told her that she could have anything she wanted. She took almost everything, so he started fresh with Diane, and they eventually had four children together. Richard continued getting bit parts here and there. Land of the Lost, The Hardy Boys. He was even cast as the Hulk in the Incredible Hulk TV series, but was replaced by Lou Ferrigno after production thought he wasn't bulky enough. Richard was working on the set of Silver Streak with Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder when he got a call from his agent saying that James Bond producer Albert R. Broccoli wanted to have lunch with him. Richard met with Albert, who floated the idea of Richard playing a main villain in the next Bond movie he was producing. Albert said, The character we have in mind will have special teeth, either like tools or like a shark. They will be made out of shiny steel and he kills people with them. They were already in talks with David Prowse, who was the actor inside Darth Vader's suit in Star Wars. You are part of the Rebel Alliance and a traitor. Take her away. Despite being a huge career-making opportunity, Richard was immediately turned off because it sounded like another monster character, which he was tired of playing by this point in his career. 
Again, knowing what he was worth, Richard came back to Broccoli by saying, I believe you need an actor for this role, Mr. Broccoli. If I were to play the role, I would want to give the character some real-life idiosyncrasies. Let him have a certain vulnerability to offset the bizarre teeth. Broccoli liked that, and after some more discussion, Richard was given the role of Jaws in The Spy Who Loved Me. Richard, true to his word, added little things to his character to make him more human. There's a scene where he picks up a giant rock to throw it at Bond, drops it, and pretends that it landed on his foot. Richard has said that he thinks people liked Jaws so much because he's just doing his job. There are very few people that are stone-faced killers in real life. So, I, you know, I think it's a lot more interesting to play a villain as a person who is real. A real-life villain, you know, he still has a mother, a father, a girlfriend, a, a dog or something. I made the character uh, more entertaining, kind of like uh, uh, Coyote and the Roadrunner and the Coyote. You, know? you kind of feel sorry for the, the uh, Coyote shoved out the train window uh, by Bond and falling down the side of the train. Uh, he would get up and brush off his clothes, straighten up his tie onward and forward. In the end of the film, Jaws is lowered into a shark tank by Bond. Originally, Jaws was supposed to get torn apart by the sharks, but while they were shooting, production decided to shoot an alternate ending in which Jaws actually kills the sharks, then swims away. When Richard saw the movie for the first time at a special screening, he was giddy with excitement, but also nervous to see if they killed him or not. When he swam away, the audience cheered. They loved it. As a result, they brought Jaws back for the next installment, Moonraker. Richard negotiated for a bigger salary and also changed the story slightly. In Moonraker, Jaws meets a girl, and because of her, he turns against the main villain and helps Bond. Originally, they wanted the girl to be like a seven-foot woman, but Richard was really against it. He thought it was too much and suggested that the girl be a normal height, maybe a little shorter. One of the producers said, do you really think the audiences would believe that? He said, my wife is five foot one and a half. We have two children and another one on the way. They have to believe it. It works. Well, here's to us. Also something to note is that from this time forward, Richard brought his family with him whenever he had to travel abroad to shoot something. This way he wasn't gone for months at a time, and he always had them with him so they could have fun together. Here they are in Spain, Paris, Israel. <laughs> what a life. And when he was shooting The Spy Who Loved Me, his son Richard George made a cameo as a kid on the beach pointing out James Bond's car driving out of the ocean. After the Bond movies, Richard didn't have to worry about struggling for acting work anymore. He was everywhere, popping up for interviews, plugging Bond movies, being a guest on Match Game. That would be the highlight of my career. He played bigger roles in films like So Fine, Cannonball Run 2, and Pale Rider with Clint Eastwood. He'd also make the occasional appearance in TV commercials. Documents! Midas muffler guarantee, good for as long as you own your car. I shall report it to the top. Our customers have been doing it for 25 years. Richard even wrote, produced, and starred in his own movie for kids, The Giant of Thunder Mountain. The story of a little girl, an unforgettable adventure, and a giant-sized hero. Hi, I'm Richard Keel. You probably know me as Jaws from the James Bond movies. Well, I'm here today to tell you about my light rider scooter. It's fantastic, and I want you guys to know that you can travel all over the world on airplanes with a scooter like this. In 1992, Richard was involved in a serious car accident. He was on a narrow road on a mountainside, rounding a blind corner, and he had to swerve to miss a car stopped in the middle of the road. He missed it barely, but hit another oncoming car that sent him careening off the side. He survived, but he had some brain damage that affected his auto-balance mechanisms and auto-gate mechanisms. What this means is he couldn't do simple things like stand in place, or alternate his arms and legs when he walked. Or at least if he could, he really had to concentrate to do it. Eventually, he couldn't get around without using a wheelchair or a scooter. This certainly limited the parts he could play, but that didn't get him down. He cites his work in Happy Gilmore as an example of how a production can be willing to work with an actor's handicaps. In every scene, and I actually noticed this when I first watched it, but I didn't know why, he's either leaning on someone or something. And in the scene where he was running after Shooter McGavin, they had him on a dolly pretending to run. Despite the limitations, I always loved him in this movie, and so did a lot of people. Trying to reach the green from here, Shooter? That's not possible, sir. I beg to differ. 
Happy Gilmore accomplished that feat no more than an hour ago. Well, moron, good for Happy Gilmore, oh my god! Whenever he was at a convention signing autographs, people would quote Happy Gilmore lines to him. And you can count on me waiting for you in the parking lot. In the latter part of his career, he was writing books, he spent most of his time at these conventions, doing the occasional James Bond interview, always willing to give his time to a random podcast or web newscast. You can tell he was a patient man, enduring the same questions over and over again. How tall are you? Were you always this tall? When you walk down the street nowadays, do you still freak people out? Are the kids running left, right and center? So what was it like to have those teeth in all the time? And what were those teeth like? How did they make those teeth? Was it ones that fitted over? They were made out of chrome. They were cast uh, by a dental technician. Those teeth were rather terrifying. He was a pro, and he was always kind to his interviewers. He also continued popping up in a few projects whenever they came along. I like his cameo at the end of Inspector Gadget. The joke is that Dr. Claw's henchman has joined a support group for other formerly evil henchmen, and Richard's sitting front row with steel teeth. Some other henchmen are implied, like Oddjob, Knickknack, Igor... Ah, I don't know, that's all I can figure out. He also showed up in a kid's show called Bloodhound Incorporated, and did a voice in Tangled. <laughs> Is this you? Oh, now they're just being mean. On September 10th, 2014, three days before his 75th birthday, Richard Keel died of a heart attack. It was tough reading Richard's book knowing that he died just last year, especially this one part. In the last chapter of the book, Richard discusses his faith. Now whether or not you're a religious person, this chapter was written purely out of love. He was very religious, especially later in life, and on the last page, he asks the reader if they're interested in Christianity. He offers a prayer for the reader to say out loud, and then underneath he writes, Welcome, my brother or sister, to the family of God. If you prayed this prayer, I would like to hear from you, and you can contact me. Then he gave his email address, a P.O. box number, and said, Thank you for letting me share my life with you. Richard Keel is an inspiration to me personally for a number of reasons, most of which is this. He worked hard. I know that sounds simple, but he never stopped working, no matter what he was doing. He wasn't one of these actors that said, I must be an actor all the time. I don't want to do anything but act, or I won't be happy. I think that mindset can set you up for failure. If you're thinking like that, what you're essentially saying is, my life sucks now, but it won't soon. Then soon doesn't come as soon as you want it to, and you find yourself depressed, wondering why you're wasting your time. As my side job, I'm an Uber driver. I've been doing this for close to a year, and there are some days when it's discouraging. Weeks go by with no auditions, or when I do get an audition, it might not go anywhere. Passengers ask me all the time what I do besides drive for Uber, and there are times when I'll just lie and tell them I'm a student. It's just depressing sometimes. But I keep reminding myself that it's something that I just need to do. Almost every actor goes through this. Richard did it for 17 years and didn't put his life on hold for anything. He just lived and worked other jobs when he had to. He took it like a real man, knew what he was worth, and didn't take shit from anyone. It doesn't help to complain or to get down on yourself because you're not doing what you want to do every second of the day. Thinking about Richard Keel's life helps me hold on to that mentality and helps me realize what really matters. Thanks, Richard. Well, here's to us.